What? Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Breakpoint Community Church. Uh, we're so excited to be together again. Uh, just thinking what a beautiful day and morning it is out this morning. And uh, spring is here and summer's coming. So nice. Uh, it's a great day to gather and to worship Jesus, to set our minds and our hearts on Jesus. And let's just do that now by praying and asking the Lord to um, set our minds on him. Lord, uh, we thank you for who you are. Uh, Lord, if you weren't real and true and our God, uh, Lord, this wouldn't uh, mean anything. So we thank you so much that you are a good and loving God and real and true and I pray that you would help us to set our minds and our hearts on you now as we enter into worship. And we just thank you for everything that you've done for us. Thank you for giving us the cross. Thank you for giving us Jesus. Thank you for giving us each other. Uh, and thank you for giving us times like these where we can worship you, Lord, together uh, with all of our hearts souls, minds, and strengths. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. You look good. You ready to praise them this morning? We're going to need your help. Um, normally we have a, uh, a full band, as you've noticed. <clears throat> if you're new to us, we normally have a full band. Uh, we typically like to do that, but every once in a while we want to strip it back and uh, just make sure that the word and uh, is the first thing that we're really considering here and um, get get some of these tra traditional songs back in the in the in the realm all right please stand and worship with us Oh, 
Good morning. It's so good to see you here this morning. Let's just take a moment and welcome those around us. You may be seated. There you go. Well, it's a great day. The sun is shining. Uh, I don't know about you, but I needed a little sunshine after the, the cold, wet week. Uh, if our ushers would come forward, it's now time for our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, we just thank you today for your love. Father, we t thank you today for... Uh, who you are and what you want to do in our lives. And Father, today I pray that as we give, that we might give because uh, you love us and we love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about today is, uh, uh, one of the things I want to talk to you about, every year we do an I Love Breakpoint offering. And we sent out an email. If you didn't get that email, there are some hard copies on the table in the foyer. But I Love Breakpoint is an annual giving uh, campaign for our church. And over the past few years, if you've been here, you know that we've done a lot of upgrades. Like, uh, I know if you're new, you don't know, but we used to have these uh, classroom uh, lights in here that were horrible and you'd turn them on and it was like they would scare you, you know, because they all came on at once and we did that. And we painted the ceiling black and we put in a new screen and so we've done quite a bit over the years to help uh, enhance the worship experience. But one of the things that we now need to do is paint the outside of the building and do some work on the outside. So. Uh, when you give to this offering, uh, it's going to help uh, with painting the outside of the building. The other side is we have uh, hired two new people, and uh, I love the two guys that we have hired. They just have a great uh, love for the Lord and a love for our kids and a love for our people. But one of the things we knew when we hired two people that the budget would be tight. And so with giving to this I Love Breakpoint, it will help sustain their salaries, okay? And so uh, that's one of the things, you know, August and September, it gets pretty tight around here. Um, and so, but we're gonna work on that too. But uh, uh, it will help sustain those salaries. And then one of the things that's not in this letter but God has laid it upon my heart to do. This man right here has been by my side for how many years now? 16 years. 16 years. And he is a great worship leader, but what you don't realize about Scott is that he does everything around this church. Uh, if there's a remodeling job, he's been a part of it. If, if what, whatever it is, new sound, new, what, what, whatever it is, he has his hand in it. And one of the things I want to do this year is make sure that uh, we compensate him a little better. And so when you give to this I Love Breakpoint Church, uh, you know, it's going to help us uh, compensate him a little better because in those 16 years 
we couldn't have made it without some of the things that he has done. And I can tell you that if I would have tried to do the handyman stuff that he's done, uh, none of the bathrooms would work. Not, you, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, over the years. And so, so you just have to realize uh, even the remodel of this downstairs, uh, it was Scott who, uh, you know, helped us. And then the first time, and then the second time after the flood, uh, you know, he, he's just done it all. And so we want to uh, hopefully this year help him out. And, you know, we love him. Everybody loves Scott. And uh, so, you know, give so that we can compensate him properly. And I always say this. Uh, Yes, it looks like a large amount when you start looking at one offering. It looks like a large amount. But if everybody just gives according to what they can, and the word there is everybody, you, you, you know, it, it's, it's not left up to one person. And don't think that your uh, little bit doesn't help. Um, it all helps. And so this is something that we as a church do together. And so, and that's why it's called I Love Breakpoint. And we've been doing it for almost uh, 22 years every year. And so uh, uh, there are hard copies on the table outside, and there are also envelopes that you can uh, give in or you can just write I Love Breakpoint on a check, or if you give electronically, you can check the I Love Breakpoint Fund. Uh, but that's uh, kind of what we're doing this year. And so I love you, and uh, you know I know that God has great things in store for this church. I just, I, I see it, I see the excitement here, I see what God is doing here. I don't know if all of you were here last week, but we baptized five people, and, and uh, you know, it was just a great Easter Sunday, so God is doing great things, and I know that he is going to provide for us for the future, but, uh, you know, pray about it and give what you can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your love, and we thank you that you're a great God. And God, you already know our needs, and you already know um, the amount that people are going to give for this offering. And so I just pray that you would just uh, uh, prick our hearts uh, to help this church move forward and to minister to people and to minister to this community and to minister to people around the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I guess you really, you really do love what you're doing when you have no idea how long you've been doing it for. And uh, I'm just so blessed that uh, you guys let me lead you in song every Sunday. And I just love this church. And uh, God only knows that uh, when I left rock and roll, uh, nobody saw this coming. That's all I can say. And that's why God is so good. Darkness seems to hide his 
thank you that even in the middle of our hardest fight, you will rescue us. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is in this place, and I pray today that your presence would overwhelm people here and that we would move toward you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, Scott, see? Not working. See? See, that's, that's how... <laughs> if we didn't have Scott. <laughs> Thank you. Well, one of the things that... Uh, you know, I, I look at today, and as we came in here today, we're going to finish up the book of John. Uh, we've been in the book of John a long time, and I hope that it's one of the things that uh, 
you've gotten a lot out of because the book of John is, it, it, it's just one of those books that shows you who Jesus is and his ministry. And, uh, you know, I always say that John, the book of John is one of my favorite books, but then I'll start teaching in something else and I'll say, well, this is one of my favorite books. I realize that, but uh, I love the Bible. And so when you love the Bible and you love uh, what the Bible teaches you, it's so uh, exciting to me. You know, I start reading, and I've been pastoring this church for 22 years, and I've been in ministry for uh, longer than that. Uh, and I always find new things. Uh, that's the great thing about the Bible is, and so that makes it exciting. And I can tell you this, when I first became a believer, the Bible made no sense to me. And I would read it, and I'm like, what is all of this stuff? And then, as I read it more often and more, then I started putting the pieces together. Not that I understand all of it now. Uh, there are still some things that I don't understand. But it becomes exciting to you, the stories and how God put together the Bible. You know, and that's what I want for you. Some of you may uh, be reading the Bible and you're like, what is all of this stuff? And I want to tell you, just keep reading. And then when you get through it and you say, well, there was a lot I didn't understand, read it again. And then read it again. And even like Leviticus, where you have all of these numbers and all these rules and regulations and all of that, I look at it and the first time I read it, I was like, what is this? I'm never going to get through this book. And I don't know if you're like me, but when I read the Bible uh, or read anything and it doesn't hold my thought process, I start thinking about other things and I've read five pages and then I'm like oh what did I read <laughs> yeah yeah you know well I did that f with Leviticus probably the first four or five times I read through it and then I thought you know what this book is about detail and it's about how detailed God is in our life and how he is concerned with the small details because how many of us think that God is just a distant God and he doesn't really care about me but when you start reading the details in the Old Testament you're like oh God is concerned about all the details of your life and he loves you so much that he wants to be intimately involved in the day-to-day -day things of your life and so as we look at John chapter 21, I want you to remember as we talk through this that God is involved and wants to be involved in the details of your life. In John 21, chapter 1 through 3, can we do it on the screen from back there? It says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. I'm not drunk. I, you know, I swayed there. I haven't been drinking, so I just want you to know that. Uh, uh, just my glasses, they're trifocals, you know, and so sometimes when you go up. Uh, so anyway, uh, when you look at this, after this, we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus that after the resurrection, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the sea. Simon Peter, Thomas called twin, Nathaniel from Cana of Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two others of his disciples were together. I'm going fishing, Simon Peter said to them. We're coming with you, they, they told him. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And so, you know, what a great thing to do, go fishing. One of the things in my life is that I want to fish more. You know why I like fishing is because 
I don't even care if I catch anything. You're just out in God's creation and nobody's talking to you. I'm just saying. It's one of those times where you can get along. So these men went fishing and, you know, they caught nothing. And I guess they were saying, you know, that's a bad thing. For me, being in a boat on water all night, it's fine. But they caught nothing. When daybreak came, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Friends, Jesus called to them, you don't have any fish, do you? No, they answered. I love that. You don't have any fish. You've been up all night. You haven't caught anything, right? Kind of pointing out there uh, that they have no fish. Verse 6. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, he told them, and you'll find some. So they did, and they were unable to haul it in because of the large number of fish. So as we look at this, Jesus told them, exactly where to fish. He didn't just say, throw the net in, did he? He said, throw the net into the water on the right side. And they caught so much that they were unable to haul it in. Verse 7, the disciples, the one Jesus loved. Now, we know who the one Jesus loved is by now, right? The writer of this book. He's pointing to himself, oh, Jesus loved me more than the rest of them, right? Uh, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tied his outer clothing around him, for he had taken it off and plunged into the sea. Since they were not far from land, about a hundred yards away, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish. Now, isn't that like Peter? Oh, look, there's Jesus. Let me just jump in and swim. You know, we've seen over and over how Peter acts. And, you know, a lot of times, what, what does he do? He, he acts without thinking. Anyone with him? You just kind of do things. Uh, you know, I'm a little like that. A little reactionary to things, right? A lot of people are. So he jumps in. The other people came in the boat like smart people. And then when they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish lying on it and bread. Bring some of the fish you've just caught, Jesus told them. So Simon Peter climbed up and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Now, isn't it kind of crazy that John goes into such detail that there were 153 fish? And I can tell you this. People have tried to figure out that 153. And they've come up with all kinds of things like the Ten Commandments plus the Seven Gifts is you know, all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I think John was trying to tell us there were a lot of fish. 153 of them in one net. 153. There were so many. Come and have breakfast. It's all right. Come and have breakfast, Jesus told them. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Now, you know, I started off telling you that that God is in the details. Jesus is in the details. What does Jesus do here? He invites them to what? Eat with him. When you have someone over to your house to eat, it's an intimate time, right? You want to get to know someone. You want to know the details of their life. If you invite me to breakfast, I'm not awake yet. You won't understand the details of my life. But for most people, this is seen as an intimate time together with God. And these people are important to Jesus. And so he invites them and he provides the best. He performs a miracle for them and then invites them to partake in the food of that miracle. And it says... 
They didn't have to ask who he was because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. Now, Jesus is God. He's God's son. And who was doing the serving? Jesus. You see, not only does he not only want to have an intimate relationship with you. He wants to serve you, serve with you in ministry. You're not left alone in this world. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told them. Now, now what is Jesus doing? He's feeding, right? And when you start talking about lambs, it's talking about shepherding. And so we have a picture here of Jesus telling Peter if he loves him to shepherd his people to love his people. And I love this because as we're going to see, Jesus asked Peter three times, do you love me? And how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. And so here he's showing Peter, and he doesn't say, Peter, you did something wrong. He doesn't point out Peter's failure. He says, do you love me? If you do, shepherd my people. Next verse. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told me, told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep, Jesus said. And so Peter was grieving, right? Because Jesus kept asking him, do you love me? But Jesus was trying to make a point that if we love him, then we have a job to do or a responsibility to do, and that is to feed my sheep, to shepherd his people. And we have to look that, that Jesus is restoring Peter to fellowship with him. In verse 18, it says, Truly I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. I love this. That at some point, right, other people have to take care of you. He said this to indicate by what kind of death Peter would glorify God. After saying this, he told him, follow me. Now, in the Bible, it gives us clear definition of what it means to follow Jesus. And it says that if we are to follow him, the first thing we have to do is, and we hate this, I'm just going to be honest with you, to deny ourselves. To deny ourselves, to put God first. In this world, who are we taught to put first? Ourselves. And so it's really hard to get this mentality of, I am to deny myself so that I can follow Jesus, that I want to make him top priority. 
And then it says that we have to take up our cross and follow him. You know, there's a lot of debate over what take up your cross means. What I believe is, uh, and I'm just going to simplify it, but what I mean it is that we are all called to do something and to serve God. And so when we start taking up our cross, it means that we have to give up things, maybe even suffer and be persecuted for doing what God has called us to do. You know, we want everything to be simple, don't we? Even our relationship with God. Many of us want from God what? The things that we want. In fact, a lot of times our prayers reflect that. God, do this for me. God, do this for me. God, do this for somebody else. But how many of us pray, God, give me a heart that I can deny myself and take up my cross so that I can truly follow you. You know, we sang that song about that Jesus will rescue us. Do you realize that for most of us, we've already been rescued by Jesus? When we accept him as our personal savior, he rescued us from perishing. He rescued us from drowning in our sin. And what did we have to do to be rescued? Nothing. Except believe in him. You see, Sometimes we think it's about our works. Works come in after we have a relationship with him because we want to follow him and do what he says. And we want to please him. But works has nothing to do with about rescuing. About his rescuing. Works come in because we want to please God once we have a relationship with him. Do you know that most people who don't have a relationship with God but try to do it by works burn out? Because you have no motivation behind your works. You're just trying to do something good and try to earn some points to get into heaven. But that never works. It's about starting with this relationship, this intimate relationship here that John is talking about. And even Peter, after denying Jesus three times, still can be restored and still have a place in God's kingdom. And still have a job to do for God. You see, nothing you do can keep you from God. Except not believing in Him. When we don't believe, then we're denying what? who he is, and what he's done for us. As I read this last chapter of Tom, John, I just see the intimacy that God wants with us. I see the intimacy of how God wants us, wants to work in our lives so that we can do his work in this world. And it's really all about taking his love and passing it on to the world. You see, he keeps saying, feed my sheep, shepherd my people, love my people.
the last things before Jesus ascends into heaven is talking about our relationship with him. If we love him, then we'll feed them. We'll shepherd them. Do you realize if the church, and I mean the church, not just this church, got on board with following Jesus and feeding his people, the impact that the church and believers would have in this world? There would be no stopping Christianity from spreading in this world. But it goes back to denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following him. Next verse. So Peter turned around and saw the disciple Jesus loved. Who's that? John. Following them. And the one who had leaned back against Jesus at supper and asked, wants to make sure he knows he has that intimate relationship with Jesus. Lord, who is the one that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him? In other words, what, what about John, you know? Uh, if I want to remain until I come, Jesus answered, what is that to you? As for you, follow me. In other words, don't worry about him. Worry about yourself. How many of you compare your relationship with God to other people? And you look at them and go, oh, well, I'm better than they are. Or I'm worse than they are, right? You can do it both ways. And, and here, Jesus is saying, don't compare your relationship with other people. Your relationship with God is what's important. And so don't compare. Don't look. Yours could be better. Yours could be worse. If yours is better, what happens? We might get a little prideful. If it's worse, we think, Oh, well, I'm just going to give up. And so you are where you are in your relationship with God, and that's okay. The important thing is that we keep moving forward in our relationship with God. So this rumor spread to the brothers and sisters that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not tell him that he would not die. But if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? And this rumor was even uh, carried forward because who was the last disciple to die? John. And so, and so this rumor keeps going that John's not going to die. He, he's, it's going to be Jesus is going to return. But that wasn't the truth. That's not the point that Jesus was trying to make here. It said, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. In other words, John was here to what? T talk about Jesus, to have a testimony for Jesus. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if every one of them were written down, I suppose not even the world itself could contain the books that would be written. Why? Because the story continues today. The story's not over with Jesus. And so we have to understand that and know that if everything that Jesus had done throughout history, there would be book after book after book after book. In fact, each one of us who know Jesus personally, we could write a book. We could write a book about how Jesus continues to work in our lives. And so as we close the book of John, we've seen the I am statements. 
We've seen who Jesus is. We've seen John point us to Jesus. We've seen John tell us about how who Jesus is, the characteristics of Jesus, and it was all to give us a glimpse of who Jesus is in our lives and that he wants an intimate, personal relationship with each one of us. Jesus doesn't want to be a distant God. Jesus doesn't want to be a God that, that you only need when you're in trouble, that you call out to. He wants to rescue you. He wants to rescue you from perishing. He wants to provide for you. He wants to rescue us from the chaos of this world to bring peace and joy and hope to your lives. He wants to deliver you from things in your life that may have a hold on you. He doesn't want you to live in bondage, but he wants you to live in freedom. You see, the book of John just opens up a relationship between you and an almighty that's why when somebody is struggling in their relationship with God and they say, where can I go in the Bible? I say, go to John so that you can begin to understand who he is and what kind of relationship he wants with you. But once you have that relationship, I think it's very important that in this last chapter he says follow me feed my sheep to follow him is a connection to feed my sheep shepherd my people love my people and this call is not only to love your family or the people that are easy to love this call is to love all people this call is to love even those people who uh, seem unlovable this call is to shepherd people who are difficult do you ever have any difficult people in your life this call is to love them you know, some difficult people, you can put boundaries on them and still love them, but you're called to love them. You, you look at it and go, wow, me, I'm called to shepherd people. And a lot of people say, oh, that's the pastor's job. It's not just the pastor's job. Who is God calling you to love, to reach out to, to minister to? Is God calling you to a deeper walk with him? To see that he's not just a distant God, but an intimate God. You know, for me and for each one of you, I just want each one of us to move forward in our relationship with God. Don't become stale. Don't become stagnant. Because it's easy to do. People say, oh, I've been a, I've been a Christian 32 years. I'm not going to do that. Oh, I've been a Christian 40 years. I'm not going to do that. I even hear sometimes, I... You know, 
that's behind me. I did this and this and this. No. God wants to use you. He wants you to shepherd his people if you love him. Then I hear people say, oh, well, when I get older, I'll follow him. Oh, when I get settled down or I do this or I do this, then I'll follow God. There's no day like today to say, when Jesus asks you, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. I hope that you'll answer that call today. To feed the, fe the, the, the sheep. To feed people, to love on people, just because you love Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your great love. And God, today, I pray that as we follow you, that we would learn to trust you, and that through following you, we would see that uh, that is that takes being obedient to what you would have for us. So help us to trust and obey. just a little bit about our mission trip. Uh, we leave Saturday uh, going to Del Rio and we're going to Centauro, the Disability Center. And we have uh, 20 people from here going and I think three from Benton going. And we're going to be doing 10 different projects. And so we're going to be feeding them. 
We're going to be doing a little Bible story time. We're going to do some medical things. I'm not going to remember everything, uh, but uh, we're going to do some projects, construction type projects. And so uh, I, one of the things is pray for us. Uh, as we're going, we're going to pray for the team here in a minute. But the second thing is, uh, before we go on a mission trip, we uh, usually take up an offering to uh, help with the mission trip. And so we'll have a basket on the table outside that you can put uh, anything that you would like to put to help us with supplies of the mission trip and those kind of things uh, as we leave next week. We're really excited about the mission trip and I think this is one of the things that we can do to uh, uh, feed his sheep right and to love on people because uh, when we went a year ago I can tell you that these people were starving they were literally fighting over food we saw that we saw them fighting over food and uh, the conditions have gotten some better as far as the feeding the living conditions uh, are getting better, but they're still bad. And so we're going to be, oh, we're going to be cleaning their dorms. We're going to be ripping mold and mildew out of bathrooms. Uh, they've got a new septic system going in. We're going to uh, do the foundation for a new shower house. Uh, so we're going to do all kinds of things. And uh, pray for us next week as we're gone uh, daily, but also... Um, uh, as you pray, pray specifically that these forgotten people are shown love because uh, they need love. And, uh, you know, sometimes it is difficult to love on people that aren't clean, you, you know, um, uh, have some mental health issues. Um, have some addiction problems. And uh, so, you know, give us the strength to last a week of loving on these people every day and not just be there for the construction projects or, or making sure they're fed, but that we love on these people. So uh, if you're here today and uh, you're going on the trip, if you would stand, we're just going to pray for you, all right? If you're, you're here and you're going on the mission trip, Heavenly Father, we just thank you today for your great love. And Father, I thank you for the sacrifice these people have made uh, to uh, pay their own money <laughs> to go on this trip to serve others. And Father, I pray that you would uh, give us wisdom as we minister to these people. Give us wisdom as we try to uh, do these construction projects because uh, really uh, some of them might be uh, over our abilities. And so I pray that you would just uh, uh, be with us on that. Help us to love these people. Help us to uh, share Jesus with them through this Bible story time. But Father, most of all, I pray that you would just help us to uh, bind our hearts as a group uh, as we minister to people. God, keep us safe. Uh, help us to not be on our own agenda, but on your agenda. And Father, I pray that you would just uh, uh, work in the lives of these people who have uh, volunteered to go. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, and like I said, the basket will be in the foyer if you would like to give towards these projects. I got to say a few more. I, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, love everybody. <laughs> um, uh, one of the things uh, we are going to do is it is time to nominate elders. And so next week we will have a a uh, box with slips of paper that you can nominate elders for our church and they have to have been a member for one year uh, and you know serving in the church and all those kind of things there's some qualifications we'll put those out also so you can nominate for elders and then it is that time of the year that we're going to be doing our budget and we're going to have a uh, budget meeting 
Sunday, May 19th at 5 p.m. Okay, so budget meeting, Sunday, May 19th at 5 p.m. And so you can come and see how we spent our money last year and how we hope to spend our money this coming year. And of course, the church has to approve that budget. Uh, so that's May 19th. All right. All right. And it doesn't get more exciting than that, right? <laughs> uh, couple of announcements for this morning. April 12th, uh, for the youth group, there's a volleyball and game night. Um, they're meeting with Calvary E-Free Church. Please bring $5 for that. That's from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, again, that's for the youth group. Uh, next slide there. We have a ladies brunch, and I'm going to invite two of our ladies from the ladies team, or the women's ministry team. We're going to share a little bit, <laughs> share a little bit about this ladies brunch that's coming up. I'm Marilyn, and this is Becca, and we're part of the women's ministry uh, team that's put together a great opportunity for fellowship and food, just like Pastor Bart was talking talking about what Jesus just did. Um, and so we're going to be hosting a brunch for the ladies. So please sign up on the app, on the church app, April 27th, 1030 to something. And the food is going to be amazing, and it's just 10 bucks. So please go on the app and join. Thanks. <laughs> Yep, thank you very much. Yep. All right, and we can get another round of applause after I'm done too, okay? All right. Uh, <clears throat> we also have, uh, for that Centoro trip, uh, medical supplies are, are needed for that. Um, so you can scan that uh, code right there if you'd like to help purchase some of the medical supplies for this trip. Um, you can do that there. We have an Explore Breakpoint class coming up. That's April 28th. That's going to be after the service, the end of this month. Um, you, it's just a class to find out more about our church. It's also our membership class. If you'd like to become a member of our church and just commit here and commit to being here. Uh, it's just um, a wonderful part of uh, our follow, following Christ and, and uh, deciding to be a part of a church. Next there, um, now you can know something, there's a little off about this slide, right? You know why that is? That's because I made it, okay? And this past week we had um, our church secretary, Syra. Um, it was her last day this week, and so I just wanted to say this is, this is what's gonna be, this is what's, what we can expect when I have to start making my own slides but uh, can we just give a round of applause to to her and just she did so much uh, we just want to thank her for, for that um, but we're having a national or on the national day of prayer uh, which is May 2nd uh, Thursday at 6 30 p.m. we are going to gather here uh, to pray and uh, just have a little worship as well um, to uh, gather and to pray um, and then if you're a visitor or gathering with us uh, this morning, we just want to thank you for coming. Uh, we hope that this church becomes a part of your church family. We, we strive to be as welcoming as possible and, and, and just to welcome everybody. Um, but there's also a computer in the lobby that you can fill out um, just your information that allows us to be in contact with you. Um, let's, just, let's just close in prayer for today. Father, Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. God, we thank you that you have a will for our lives and that we can follow you and your will uh, and, and enter into the joy of that. We pray that you would uh, just help us all the more to submit to you and to your will for our lives. Uh, and we thank you for this time of worship. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a good day.